it. Um, so we are gonna, we've got a great uh, lineup of speakers and we're gonna get started with Dr. Josh McGrath, um, who is gonna be talking about poultry litter injection. Um, Dr. McGrath has been leading a team of collaborators and Josh, I think it's, I'm sorry to say this, I think it's been like 15 years and it may be longer that you guys have been working on this. Yeah. Um, it's a big deal for us to be able to inject poultry litter. Um, as you all know, poultry litter is, chunky. It's not a homogenous material. It does not flow well. So the technical aspects of this are really challenging. Um, it's fair to say we figured out liquid manure injection. There are commercial applicators with manure injection equipment that are offering that service throughout the nation. So that's that we figured out. Um, but the reason it's a big deal for, for both farmers' finances and for water quality is that, I mean, we know that nitrogen prices are at crazy levels right now. And if you're injecting manure, you're capturing that nitrogen, you're improving the nutrient use efficiency of your poultry litter. Um, also, um, it's estimated that on most of Delmarva in the coastal plain regions, we are gonna um, reduce nitrogen loss to surface waters by 12% and phosphorus loading by 22%. Um, I'll post an expert panel report that discusses those, um, those reduction losses in the chat in just a moment. Um, but first I wanna acknowledge, um, you know, what a commitment uh, for Dr. McGrath and his team uh, to get this started. Um, we, they've received funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, from the United States Department of Agriculture's Conservation and Innovation Grant Program, and from the Maryland, uh, Chesapeake and Atlantic Coastal Bay Trust Fund among you, Josh, you probably have gotten other funding uh, since the, the work that I'm familiar with. Um, so Dr. McGrath, please get us started. Thanks, and Kristen. Post, I'll, po I'll post a link to Dr. McGrath and every, all the other speakers in the chat as well. <clears throat> Thanks, Kristen. And uh, yeah, I mean, I can't take um, much credit for leadership of the team. Uh, Pete Kleiman, who's on here, and uh, Doug Beagle, I think first kind of brought the Chesapeake Bay team together with our first um, uh, funding from NOAA. Uh, actually, I think was the first grant you got, right, Pete, um, to for litter injection, bringing up the subsurfer from USDA ARS uh, at the Dale Bumpers Research Group down in Arkansas. And um, and we've been kind of going with it since. And I, it, it sort of has fallen into my lap here recently. And Simmer Burke is on uh, now. Uh, Wes Porter will be joining us later from University of Georgia. And they're currently um, doing some of the engineering work. It's kind of an engineering project now. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So let me share my screen. Unfortunately, uh, this talk was supposed to be Jordan Shockley, who is another uh, Del Marva native. Um, uh, interestingly enough, after I came to the University of Kentucky, for those of you that know me, I spent a long time in Maryland and Delaware. And um, so, uh, Jordan Shockley came to the University of Kentucky uh, shortly after me as an ag economist, and uh, he grew up outside of Federalsburg, Maryland, uh, for those of you from over on the Delmarva Peninsula. And so he and I hit it off uh, working on poultry litter uh, issues and the litter injector. And so some of that's what I'm going to talk about, because currently we're kind of in a, um, in a uh, engineering phase, and we're letting that, that engineering be guided by um, the, the economic goalposts that, that Jordan has worked on. Unfortunately, Jordan at the last minute got called away to do a carbon trading talk. And he is on a panel right now with a USDA uh, undersecretary and he hopes to join us in a little bit. Um, so with that, let me see if I can get uh, started here. Um, so what we know, uh, we know that uh, regional specialization, basically we grow a lot of chickens in one area and a lot of grain in another underlie some of the nutrient surpluses that lead to water quality problems. And we know that we need to move some poultry litter around, especially in regards to where uh, we've elevated soil test uh, phosphorus. Um, and this has led to some water quality concerns. And we need to move more poultry litter than we move. And we need to manage it properly uh, wherever it goes. So this is just kind of background. And early on, we did some work on the Delmarva. This is some of my research from Maryland. Uh, where we looked at the effect of, uh, we know no-till has a lot of, of benefit, but when it comes to the coastal plain of the Delmarva and phosphorus loading, no-till with poultry manure contributes to higher phosphorus loads 
compared to vertical tillage like a turbo till or strip tillage or conventional tillage. And that's just because of that soil to manure contact increases sorption and decreases that dissolved load that dominates the loading in these coastal plain landscapes. And so, you know, this is part of the justification. Uh, we said, well, we need more innovation because uh, no-till really has some, some distinct um, ecosystem services. It's really good for carbon sequestration and soil conservation. And so that's where these folks from the, with the subsurfer from the USDA ARS down in Boonville came up with the subsurfer. There's a picture of one of their units. And it's basically a, a no-till planter with double disc openers. Uh, some of the people on the phone call right now, uh, I think I ran one of these machines across your farms when I was at Maryland. And so it pulverizes the litter and delivers it to a slot and then it has closing wheels and it allows pretty precise control of, of poultry litter rate, which is a, a big benefit of injection besides just getting off the surface. This is some of Pete Kleiman's data, who's on the call. And it shows that, you know, you basically eliminate that phosphorus runoff that is uh, directly from litter application when you put it uh, subsurface bandit with the subsurfer. Here's a picture. Uh, I think these are some plots we did with Jonathan Quinn. Um, and you can see we went through a pretty heavy cover crop there and you can hardly tell where we went injecting that poultry layer. So clearly it's not exposed, exposed to the surface for runoff. And then, um, Jumped a little bit too far ahead there. So, um, you know, we looked at modifying the injector to provide even more environmental and production value. Uh, getting that phosphorus subsurface has big environmental value, but really uh, there's not that much economic incentive to inject it. There's a little bit of nitrogen benefit, um, but what we did was we added nitropyrene in the form of instinct, uh, treated the litter as it was being injected. I did some of this work with uh, Amy Schober, who's on the call. And we saw huge benefits. Uh, this was pretty limited temporal and spatial replication, but we did some lab studies and some field studies. And in the lab, we saw that basically uh, surface applied litter, we could get the same yield with 84 pounds less nitrogen at side dress, uh, 245 bushels per acre, cutting the nitrogen rate 84 pounds by injecting with instinct. And instinct's a nitrification inhibitor. And so it keeps that poultry litter nitrogen from going past the ammonium states to nitrate where it can be denitrified or leached. And so having that, that nitrogen in the soil as ammonium is, uh, you know, a big conservation measure. Or we could also get the same yield, uh, get, get this with the same nitrogen rate, get even more yield, 16 bushels per acre. And so if you balance those two, we could get, you know, about 15 more bushels to the acre with almost 80 pounds less nitrogen with injection. So clearly there is some upside here. Um, but there was a lot of drawbacks as far as the machinery. Uh, poultry litter, I think most people know, has a lot of value. And so now I'm going to integrate some of the economic work uh, that I've done with Jordan and recently with Josh Duke at uh, Auburn. And so places that have a lot of poultry farm, those send poultry litter, those sending farms, uh, they generally only derive nitrogen value uh, because they've built up their soil test phosphorus, their soil test potassium. Uh, there's some liming benefit, but that is minor economics. So the big economic driver of litter on the farm that would have to be replaced is that nitrogen value. And depending on timing, that could be zero to about $30 a ton. Um, and the reason I, I put that in there about timing is because we have to think about regions outside the Delmarva. For example, here in Kentucky, the vast majority of poultry litter that's applied, and we're a large poultry producer, is applied in the fall because of time constraints with wet soils that I'll talk about in a second. And so with that fall application, we estimate that there's very little nitrogen value because we have so much denitrification in our wet natured soils. Now we move that litter to another farm where they haven't elevated their soil phosphorus and potassium. And on average, these numbers I'm using are coming um, from the University of Kentucky Soil Testing Lab, the average NP and K content for Kentucky poultry litter, by the way, and current present day um, phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium uh, values which are extremely high all the farmers on the call know that um, so minus shipping and handling at the receiving farm uh, you're going to get about 62 dollars per ton value in p and k so that means we're up to 92 dollars per ton of value in litter at the receiving farm compared to about 30 dollars at the sending farm so that should motivate some litter movement injection though provides only nominal increased value about 10 dollars per ton via that decreased ammonia nitrogen loss. And so it's not enough to justify uh, the expense of injection. 
So with the original subsurfer, we saw inconsistent performance. We'd get things like uh, this tunneling. And so uh, a row unit would shut down and not have litter come out. It's extremely slow because it's only about 10 foot wide and you can't go very fast. And there's a lot of downtime when things break down and, and when you're loading it up. It was also very expensive, about $50,000 per unit. And so there's not enough nutrient efficiency or upside to balance out the total cost of adoption of a technology that's really somewhat undependable. And so, um, you know, this is when we really thought, okay, we have to update, we have to make a machine that can be utilized by a producer that, that meets uh, modern production standards. And so that's where this idea came from. We started working with Oklahoma State with Randy Taylor. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Wes Porter, who's going to be joining us here soon, uh, Randy Taylor was his PhD advisor at Oklahoma State. And Randy and I were sitting around in a restaurant, and I was kind of uh, complaining a lot about all the problems we were facing with the litter injector in Maryland. And he said, you know, I think I can blow poultry manure. And so he started out and then he moved into an administrative role at Oklahoma State and John Long took over from him. And this was under the SAM project that NIFWA, NIFWIF and uh, Maryland DNR funded. And he basically demonstrated that, yes, you can blow poultry litter through a three inch hose really far. And part of the trick there was figuring out an airlock, which they did. That's a real key component. So any, any of you that aren't familiar with farm equipment, Air seeders are pretty much uh, the standard now in the industry. And Simmer will talk a lot more about this when he comes on as the engineer. But this is our vision. This is what we were thinking. We need to get from the subsurfer that you saw in previous pictures to something like this air seeder with fold out booms that's running 40 or 60 foot wide with a centrally metered hopper. You're blowing the litter through hoses. Um, you know, John looked at different ways to deaccelerate that litter. And again, we had to have that airlock. And now the University of Georgia folks have kind of taken over from here with USDA ARS funding support, but we are this year going to be going looking for additional funding. So any of you on the call who are responsible for grants and are thinking this is something you like to fund, uh, hit me up. Um, so, you know, can a litter injector compete economically with broadcasting? Um, you know, the speed of broadcasting versus the efficiency and the yield benefit of the injector are kind of what we're balancing here. So you have fast and cheap with a surface applicator versus slow and expensive with an injector. And so will the benefits of the injector balance the cost? And then there's another consideration that actually was kind of exposed that Jordan's economic analysis exposed. He has a model, it's a whole farm economic model. And particularly here in Kentucky or in the uh, Corn Belt, the Eastern Corn Belt, Southern Corn Belt, um, the speed has to allow planting. That's why a lot of our litter goes down in the fall because we have a decreasing number of suitable field days for planting. And planting is probably the most important thing you do on your farm and has huge economic implications at the end of the season. And so regardless of everything else, no matter how good we make this, there has to be suitable field days to run an injector in the spring to maximize that nitrogen benefit. And so that has to be a consideration in design. Uh, Jordan had a grad student graduate in 2018, uh, did her master's and examined the economics of the litter injector. Um, she looked at fall versus spring injection or fall versus spring surface application of poultry litter in Kentucky and came to some uh, conclusions, kind of general conclusions. Uh, acres per hour had to increase from about three and a quarter acres per hour with the current subsurfer to 20 acres per hour or better as far as field capacity. The yield or nitrogen conserv benefits, uh, conservation benefits needed to increase about 7 to 10%, and we needed to get the machine cost down to $10,000. Now, any one of these alone would have made the litter injector competitive with surface application, but balancing the, a combination of those three would also do it. Because obviously, we're not going to make a machine probably for $10,000, but maybe we can get the price down some and get close to that 20 acres per hour and get a nitrogen benefit of about 10%. Percent, and then, then we'd be very competitive. But again, we have to make it so that you can get across the field and plant with the number of suitable field days present on the farms where you expect this technology to be used. 
So what do we need? We need, uh, this is where we still need research area. We need actually better baseline field performance data for status quo litter management. This may be surprising to some on the call, but we don't actually have good published numbers on how fast and what the field capacity is for surface application in both receiving and sending regions, because having moved around the country and seen two very distinct poultry producing regions of the Delmarva and Kentucky, and then spending some time with Simmer and West in Georgia, Litter is managed very differently in, the, in these different regions because of competing pressures those regions may have. We have to understand the willingness to pay and the willingness to accept payment for environmental benefit because really that's what we're talking about is, you know, we'll never make a litter injector that flat out can compete with the disposal speed of a surface applicator. But are the environmental benefits, what's the value of that to other consumers? And I'll talk about that in a second. And then expanded research on the nitrification inhibitors. The work Amy and I did was very limited in spatial and temporal replication. And so we really, once we get an up and running commercial scale litter injector, we'd like to revisit that. Uh, but we see huge upside potential incorporating a nitrification inhibitor, inhibitor with poultry litter. Uh, Jordan said, you know, the economic model is ready to go. We just need this updated data to kind of Pre prepare these uh, benchmarks for the engineering teams working on the on the litter injector. Uh, there's a QR code. I'm going to leave this up here for a second while I talk. That's for a paper I'm very excited about that Josh Duke and I just put out um, last month as part of the manure shed uh, group. And, um, you know, this ties into the litter injector because we looked at agronomic economic approaches to connect manure nutrients back to grain producing regions and technology is one of the key components of the markets that we kind of laid out as an option. Uh, we found that more efficient markets can support demand for improved manure management technology. And so often I think, and, and I think Pete Kleiman is gonna talk about this with the manure shed, we think about these technologies like litter injection. And I think for, to some extent, the reason we've been unsuccessful in the academic world is we felt like we just made this technology and we'll set it out there. And because it's good, it will be adopted. But really, it's the market that and the system that needs to be defined. And then people will find technologies like litter injectors to capture more profit. And so efficiencies in the market can be, uh, can be generated uh, by um, kind of uh, having education in the selling and buying region. So people appropriately value the product that they're buying or selling. Um, using incentive-based market design. So there's a lot of theory and there's a lot of markets out there like Equip and stuff that use different elements and computer mediated uh, markets and algorithms that optimize sales and purchases between uh, the two parties that are either, you know, matching farmers that are selling litter to those that are buying that are close together or matching farmers that are willing to pay more to farmers that are asking more for their litter because people, there's heterogeneity in what people are willing to offer or accept for their litter. And so we can optimize some of these things, but we can also have these computer mediated markets for poultry litter include some of the environmental performance so that a farmer who uses a litter injector might be more competitive in that market space and get cheaper manure because state government is willing to subsidize the transport if the litter is gonna be applied in an environmentally friendly way. And so in this way, the selling farmer and the buying farmer are able to actually capture more profit while government subsidy can go down. And these increased incentives uh, will complete, uh, kind of create this competition in the marketplace. So then farmers will look for technology that gives them this advantage. Anyway, there's the QR code that'll take you to that paper. Um, and that's a whole lot more into that. And I think Kleiman uh, is going to cover some of that. So that was really quick, just kind of an introduction to set the stage for the other speakers. Uh, there's my contact information if you have any questions. And hopefully also during the Q&A, after all the presentations, Jordan will be joining us. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And did we have time for any quick burning questions at this point, uh, Kristen, that we wanted to hit? We do. Um, we have just two clarifying questions. First, what is the minimum horsepower required to pull that injector that you slowed very in the beginning of the presentation? Um, you know, so something like that litter injector would be similar to a planter. Um, it's 10 foot wide. You know, it's got I forget how much litter we put in five or 10 tons. So we've pulled it with 125, 150 horse all wheel drive tractor. Um, very similar to a to a to a planter. 
Thanks, Josh. One more. Um, are the the economics that you put on the prices for injection, like the, the price value for injection, are those based on today's fertilizer prices that's, or on more normal fertilizer prices? No, that, so that's based on, so my poultry litter value of $62 for P&K is based on present day DAP and potash prices. I, I actually got those prices. I downloaded them yesterday and present day urea prices uh, for the for the nitrogen value. So you're looking at about a dollar nitrogen and 60 cents per pound for phosphate and potash, just rough, rough numbers, which are, you know, record high. So right now poultry litter is worth more than it's ever been worth ever in history. Okay, great. Um, so next up we have Dr. Simmerjeet Burke and Burke and Dr. Wesley Porter from University of Georgia. Um, at Dell LC, we've come to a Appreciate uh, many of us uh, the uh, uh, the University of Georgia poultry litter expertise. So, um, doctors, take it away, and I will post your uh, a link to your profiles in the chat. All right, thank you, Kristen. Um, again, my name is Simranjit Work, and uh, I will have Dr. West Porter right after me. I'm just kind of building a little bit of background and introduction, so. I'm an ag engineer and a precision ag specialist here at University of Georgia. The way I'm kind of tied to this is uh, back in my master's, I did a lot and a lot of work with uh, broadcasting poultry litter and looking at some of the better metering systems or how does that all affect you know, the application. And so I'm just gonna give you, maybe it'll show a little bit of data, you know, and. I always think about where we are today with everything else, whether we're talking about planter spray or anything and how accurately we're able to meter and place everything. Whereas when it comes to fertilizer or poultry litter, it's still you know pretty far off from even calling a precision application or anything like that. So let me see, if, uh, right there, so I guess, uh, like I said, we all know right now spinner discs, those broadcast dual spinning discs are our most common equipment to land apply the poultry litter, right? And we all know how kind of that works. Um, is basically you got a feed gate. I don't want to go over too much mechanics, right? But a conveyor chain, a slotted chain, which meters the material from a hopper. We got a flow divider, which this spreader, these spreaders are so sensitive to the setting of that flow divider that a little change changes the whole application. And then the main thing right here application, one of the biggest thing is those two discs. We're just pouring material on those and they are, you know, rotating and just dispersing that material in a semicircular pattern. And that's also tied to just the design of that machine kind of ties one of our biggest challenges is again, maintaining the application accuracy. So like I said, in my master's, I did a lot of work on how well it meters measured and how does some of the physical properties change, you know, especially when there's so much emphasis on calibrating it correctly. So this was just an example of when we did the conveyance test, just the machine stationary, uh, we're just measuring every revolution, how much material is being discharged, right? So if you look on the graph here, we had two very similar loads, just a different bulk density here. And then we calibrated it to, you know, at two different, four different application rates, actually these uh, uh, blue triangles here. And then we were able to get it within plus minus 10%, right? After a few calibrations, all that. But the minute we went to a lower, the same source, the material coming from same source, same litter, everything is just a different density. And when we measured that again, we were way over applying with the same. So the point I'm trying to make is that the reason we're not able to, you know, we'll get a lot of challenges to accurately metering it with the current application equipment. And that also goes back to both Josh and Kristen pointed out is a lot of highly variable litter properties, right? We have a lot of inconsistent particle size, non-uniform moisture content, and even the variability from the source, the feed and the housing properties, where it's coming from, you know, and what was the bedding material used and all that. And same example, not just the application accuracy, I guess the other biggest challenge is 
spreading uniformity. We, we even struggle attaining a good uniformity with our fertilizer, which is a lot more homogenous and a little bit more or similar particle size and shape than we talk about litter. So this is again, same source of material. And this is about a 30 foot swath that we caught, you know, a lot of testing just to see how well it's mirroring and same material just applied different times, you know, and this is what the distribution look like. You can have a very high peaks on the side and, and it, it's totally unpredictable what kind of pattern we're getting there. And again, this beside the equipment settings, a lot of this again goes back to the type of the litter, the source, the physical properties, all that again affects the distribution. So I guess the point where I'm getting it is, uh, especially from us where we work on the precision ag side. And like I said, everything we deal crop input wise is getting more and more precise and better and better. And as we have those new uh, over application concerns, you know, plus some of the offsite nutrient transfer, especially in the water body, stuff like that. And then we have almost from 10 years, we have emphasized so much on those four hours of nutrient stewardship. And then two of those, you know, were right rate and placement. We're missing those big time anytime we're doing any application with poultry litter. And a lot of that also comes back to the physical properties of being, which makes it really hard to uh, accurately meter and uniformly apply, right? So this kind of leads into why we're kind of working on development of an application system with our goal and Josh and I all, all are talking in my mind, I think we should be able to design a commercial scale machine or something which is almost, we're talking about the precision placement and precision metering. And that's where kind of our goal is. And I think with all the teams we have here, we should be able to achieve that you know, starting here. So with that, I'm going to let uh, Wes, as he has a graduate student working on and a lot more detail on the on the injection system that they're working on. All right. Thanks, Simmer. Um, and with this, Simmer's going to continue to share his screen um, and go through the presentation, if that's all right. Uh, yeah, let me uh, pop that back up there. Yes, because I'm um, appreciate y'all having me today. And I will apologize a little bit. If you look in the background, you can obviously tell that I'm in a uh, in a vehicle right now. And I've been at two extension meetings on the east side of our state today and tried to get somewhere with decent internet. So I'm, if anybody wants to laugh, I'm sitting at a gas station called Buzzies right now. So it uh, seems like the internet's pretty good here. So hopefully we can keep rolling with that. But um, where are we at with it? So we've kind of done a good job. Josh did a really good job of setting up the background of the economic perspective and some of our capacities and all. And Simmer talks about some of the problems that we have with current application technologies. So we've kind of tried to step up, you know, Josh set us up and talked about the OSU machine and some of the previous iterations and work there. And so this is trying to uh, continue to effort in developing the subsurface injection system. So um, previous studies have shown multiple levels of benefit. And these have been mentioned a couple of times, but if we can inject poultry litter, we can reduce nutrient losses, increase plant nutrient root zone availability, uh, provide precision placement of the litter actually on the ground, as Simmer just alluded to that, you know, with a spinner spreader, we cannot do that. We also have the opportunity to increase economic value of the litter compared to surface applications. So at the current time, there's no, um, there are mechanical systems that pre-treat the litter and deliver it to individual rows. Josh mentioned this, the Oklahoma State machine does that as the airlock system that we're basically blowing that litter back to an individual row at this point. Similarly, there are other machines that deliver the litter to or just below the surface of the soil. But no current machine pre-treats and accurately meters, and this is kind of critical here, accurately meters of poultry litter subsurface with the adequate field capacity that was mentioned earlier. And we're shooting for a goal of about 20 acres per hour. So keep that in mind. That's where we're looking at. All right, Simmer. Our vision here, what we're looking at, um, we're hoping to develop a field scale viable concept machine, which we can uh, deliver to industry partners poised for commercial deployment within about five years from now. So that's our goal. UGA, us at the current part, and I should um, iterate that we're at UG, um, we are at University of Georgia, but our, our physical location for Simmer and myself and my graduate students is the UGA Tiffin campus. So we're in the middle or the heart of ag in Georgia. We're going to act as a central testing and fabrication hub there with other institutions and agencies working with us to do that. Um, and so we've been slowly having conversations with machine manufacturers and farm partners kind of deliver some of this practical and usable machine. So some of the critical things we're looking at is still sticking with that pneumatic conveyance, 
centrally made internet, just like that picture you see up there that Josh shared earlier. We shared that picture across of an air seeder. Um, it needs to be large capacity. Um, I think this is pretty critical. This is where we really need to hone in on them. But that row unit precision metering is where we've got to get to. We've got to be greater than 20 acres per hour. And then ideally, maybe in the future, we can have some row level sensing to provide performance and feedback rate control. So similar to a planner, Josh mentioned the planner earlier, right now we can monitor seed rate as it's falling down the tubes on that planter. We're hoping to get to that point with um, poultry litter eventually. And so we've got to keep in mind the width and the speed of travel or maybe a combination of both so that we can meet some of these parameters. Thanks, Summer. So this is just real quick. You're going to see a small graphic of this. Uh, we kind of threw this together here in the past day or so, so that you can just have a full on picture. We, I would like to iterate. We, we don't have this machine sitting in Tiffany yet. We're working on small components of it. And so what I want to say, you've got that big central hopper you saw in that air seed or something similar. We've got the fan and the central divider, that OSU machine right now that is delivering um, poultry litter that's been kind of pre-treated to a central row unit meter. And then from there, from the row unit meter, it's going to go to the ground engagement or injection subsurface. Um, Simmer, go ahead. So if you notice the top right, I've used that same uh, graphic. The part that we're specifically focusing on right now for this project is to make sure we can ad adequately meter it at the row unit. So adequately and accurately. I want to talk about that in just a second, what I mean. So we're going to try to accomplish doing this, um, looking at multiple and varying compositions of poultry litter. So we're testing different compositions from across the nation, see where they're at. We have to design it to meet that meet or exceed the effective spill, uh, field efficiency and capacity of a spreader. Going back to that greater than 20 acres per hour. And then we need to allow for precision rate control. And so when we talk about that, the precision rate control, we're basically looking at what we need to be able to apply to reach that greater than 20 acre per hour parameter. And then we're going to work backwards from there so that we know that we're metering it or are able to engineer and meter it at that rate accurately. So these main objectives, we're going to evaluate uh, litter with varying, varying properties, develop some CAD models to look at some of this, um, and then do a laboratory evaluation of the system as we develop the prototype system. And then we want to have a prototype field test machine that we test on farms around, not just in Georgia, but around where it would be critical. And then we use that proto test, uh, prototype test machine to uh, work in combination with industry. Simmer. So right now, some of the work we're doing, just to show you uh, where we're at and what we're working on, is we're using 3D modeling to compare uh, different variations, different pitches of, of flight uh, for row unit metering and some of the all green in there. Um, you can just see the two left drawings are CAD drawings that my graduate student has been working on here recently and some of the stuff he's working on on his materials flow uh, work and modeling. The right, we actually have access to or we own a 3D printer uh, in my building. So those three uh, or four little red augers right there, it may be hard to see in the picture. I downgraded the quality so we could email it around, but they're actually made of two or three components. So you can see that we can take those apart, put them together um, and then actually work with those. So we're, we're, as we develop some of these parts and materials, we're basically making a mini system. And I've got some pictures of the, some of the parts that we've printed up till now and some of the stuff we're doing with it. But we're making a mini system so that we can test it on a small scale first before we build that laboratory scale system. All right, Stimmer. So we're looking at different gear designs and trying to optimize the drive of this. And so we've printed out a couple of different gears to see where we can drive some of, uh, some of these augers and move some of this litter at the row unit system and to make sure that we can meter it there. And so you can see um, what some of these look like as we're starting to design them. And those are obviously two different gear sets, but you can see we're designing them and printing those out again to have some cab models and to have some actual small scale models to work with. So some of the methods we're working with, I mentioned this before uh, through the objectives, but we're collecting and analyzing poultry litter samples to determine uh, the following parameters, basically adequate moisture to be able to meter this uh, accurately. And so that's, a, that's critical. And so even during the pretreatment process, we need to know if we have litter at a particular moisture, is there something out of the range that we can adequately, uh, adequately and accurately meter? If it is, that means we're going to do some more pretreatment or do something different in the litter before it makes it to the row, um, the actual row unit itself, or even before it to the machine checking the compressibility of that um, litter and the flowable, flowability properties of it. And so once we determine what properties by doing some of the um, flow property modeling and to see where we need to be, we're gonna take it um, and see where we need to be at a uniform state so we can use that airlock machine that was developed at Oklahoma State you saw earlier 
to move it to the individual row units. And then we need to determine litter handling methods best suited for the quality and property. So we need to know previous to that, what do we need to do for, to it before it gets dumped into that machine? And we just got a, just a picture of a mini hopper right there. You can see that we're working with, but um, before we move it in that hopper on that machine, what state does it need to be in? Do we need any pretreatment before it makes it there? Or can we just change some machine parameters to ensure that if we know going into this machine, it has these properties, this is the settings that this machine needs to be um, set to so that we can continue the metering at that point. All right, Summer. So some of the future efforts that we're working on, a couple of things, and I'll, I'll highlight some points here. But we're hoping to utilize some new funding sources to keep the momentum of this project moving forward. Um, focus on each main component in the process of applying this litter. Obviously, the, um, the component I've talked about today and the grad student that I've, uh, Cody Mathis, his name is the beginning of this uh, presentation. But what he's specifically focused on is just a metering of it, but this is a holistic project. I want you to keep that in mind that, that as we go piece by piece, we're looking at the whole, uh, the whole machine and looking at different main components in the project. And then we also want to partner with uh, the machine industry. And so again, as I mentioned earlier, we're slowly reaching out to contacts, letting them know where we stand, seeing if any of them may be interested in working with us moving forward um, so that we can make sure we can get this machine designed and where it's at. Um, the end goal, you know, as we talked about earlier, keep designing individual components to get them where they need to be, starting at this point at the metering system. That's probably our, our critical link right now is making sure that we can um, accurately meter this at the rates that we need to. So if we're designing a whole machine around that and we get to the point of all uh, the metering system and we can't meter it fast enough or accurately enough, well, that machine is really not good at that point. So we identify that we kind of do a ground up effort here. And that's, that's why we're starting at the metering system. That's, we feel like that's the most critical in the, where we need to be. And as we move from there, then we're gonna start developing the rest of the machine and start working on that field scale uh, machine and getting it ready for field testing around. Simmer. With that, um, we're gonna kind of wrap up our presentation and kind of our time slot. Um, do we have any time for questions for Simmer or myself while we're both here and available? Uh, Dr. Porter and Dr. Burke, we did have one question. Um, someone was asking whether pelletizing the litter would improve the delivery, um, you know, the evenness of delivery, um, and whether or not processing litter into pellets could be economically viable. So I, I've not, we've not explored, I've not personally, or Simon, I don't think we've explored that right now. I've heard some of the talks about pelletizing it, and if I remember correctly, I think the pretreatment of doing all that will basically uh, negate some of the work we're doing to try to use the litter as it is. And maybe I'm off base with that, but everything that I'm familiar with, if we go through that process, we're not getting the full economic benefit out of taking the litter from the houses straight in. Um, Okay, thank you all very much. Um, just a plug for some good ag engineering you guys are doing there. Good luck with your work. Um, we're looking forward to hearing of your success in the future. Um, next, we're going to hear from Dr. Amy Schober and Lee Palm Forster with the University of Delaware. They've been leading an effort along with Dr. Ryder, um, Maryland Department of Agriculture has supported this effort. Sustainable Chesapeake's been involved. Um, and National Fish and Wildlife Foundation has helped to fund um, a, a survey that was done through um, on to farmers in Delmarva and in other counties that could be received on the receiving end of poultry litter, you know, where nutrients are needed. Um, and we wanted to learn about the barriers and um, opportunities for expanding poultry litter markets. So Dr. Schober and Dr. Palm Forrester, take it away. Thanks, Kristen. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give most of the talk, but Leah is definitely here for the Q&A at the end. Um, Leah is our agricultural economist on the project. And I just wanted to mention that this particular project that we're going to talk about is it's kind of a complementary project to the manure shed work that you're going to hear about from Pete Kleiman. It was done independently and it started with a CARE, USDA CARE project that Mark Ryder at Virginia Tech uh, submitted in 2017 with a focus on the Delmarva region in particular. 
So I know that looking at the list of folks who are out in the audience, a lot of you already have a pretty good feel for what it looks like on the Delmarva and what the situation is. But for those of you who maybe live in other areas of Virginia or even in Pennsylvania, I wanted to give you a brief background. So if we look at 2020 production numbers, Delmarva poultry growers produce about 570 million broilers which is about roughly 400 chickens per person living in the region. The region has about 1.4 million people. And the map that we're showing here is showing you the distribution of poultry houses on the peninsula. And we can see here that there seems to be a pretty good concentration here in the middle portion of the peninsula, typically called the um, Maryland's Lower Eastern Shore and also Sussex County of Delaware. So the poultry litter that is generated is an important source of the nutrients for the locally grown corn and soybean crops that feed those broilers. But the birds that we produce in the region consistently consume more grain than we can produce annually, which means that we have to import additional grain into the region. And with those imports, we bring in additional nutrients. Um, this is a long-term trend, this importation of grain that's really resulted in a significant regional phosphorus imbalance. Um, that's because all of the pea that comes in in grain is excreted in manure that remains on the peninsula. And our historic and even current application of poultry litter to, to those agricultural soils, especially when we're in close, close proximity to those regions of intensive poultry production, has led over time to a buildup of soil phosphorus concentrations to levels that exceed our agronomic needs. So if you look at this map here, we're showing essentially a phosphorus balance, which looks at the phosphorus import inputs to the region minus the exports in grain and meat. And you can see that our, our area where we have rapid high intensity poultry production, we have these green colors, which indicates that phosphorus surplus. But we also noted that there are other places on the peninsula itself, particularly up in the northern part, northwestern part, and down here in Northampton County of Virginia, that actually have some phosphorus deficit. And this could be used to our advantage because we could move that litter and we could get those nutrients to farmers who could actually still use them. There's been a lot of focus too in our region on alternative uses for poultry litter, particularly in those counties where we have those high pea surpluses. There were efforts to pelletize or compost litter for use in alternative markets like the landscape and ornamental market. And litter has also been moved to southeastern Pennsylvania every year to become an ingredient in that mushroom substrate. There's been an interest in turning manure into energy through incineration or anaerobic digestion. However, when we look at these alternative uses, except for maybe the, the exports to the mushroom industry, we haven't really significantly reduced the amount of litter that is land applied in the region. And some of those efforts actually ended up being economic failures. For example, that pelletizing plant that was operated by Purdue was closed after 16 years of operation because they were failing to turn a profit. So I think there was a question earlier about pelletizing and Josh mentioned that it does, it adds additional costs to a product that is already pretty low in nutrients to begin with. As an agronomist, I think land application is still our preferred use for poultry litter, especially in the Dalmarva, because that litter provides farmers with a source of organic matter, nitrogen, sulfur, and even micronutrients that would all have to be applied to soils from another source if we didn't have access to that litter. And we've actually done some research at the University of Delaware and the University of Maryland, where we've shown that applications of litter based on crop phosphorus needs can be sustainable in the long term if we manage that litter correctly to minimize losses to the environment. And Delmarva farmers who are dealing with high concentrations of pea in their soil can also continue to use poultry litter if they apply it in at, at rates that are lower than the crop removal at, or at a phosphorus deficit. And that allows them to get some organic matter, nitrogen and microbes for their low fertility soils. We have state run programs in place designed to help us distribute and use poultry litter in a more efficient manner. We have cost share in for litter transport and storage in the region. 
Uh, and we've also had researchers who've participated in that research to build equipment that will allow for us to apply the solid litter below the soil surface. So that litter injector that you have heard about for the last two presentations. Despite all of this, we still face huge challenges with respect to litter distribution and management. Uh, and that's despite having this pretty large investment in these transport programs and other cost share programs. What I'm showing you here on this map is a, a, a snapshot of what's happened in Delaware with the transport cost share program in one year. So the dots on this map are zip code centroids and they show the origination of the areas where the manure came from and then they point out to where it has gone. But what we find interesting with this map is that the movement out of state is primarily to areas of Maryland and New Jersey for land application. And there is some movement into southeastern Pennsylvania for use in the mushroom industry. But we see that there's still a lot of transfer within the state, and especially within those areas that have significant phosphorus surpluses. And our litter, it appears, is not really moving south into Virginia or over into areas of Maryland that might benefit from receiving those nutrients. And you have to recognize this data really only represents manure transport from Delaware and only in one year, but it does really help to highlight some of our regional challenges. And this is kind of what dr drove us to ask the question, what is stopping us from this lit efficient litter distribution and use on the Delmarva? This is how we ended up uh, partnering with NIFWIF and uh, through our USDA grant that we got and some funds through um, NSF, we were able to go ahead and ask the agricultural community if they could help us identify what barriers they were facing that was preventing us from having efficient distribution of use and litter, of use of litter on the peninsula. We did uh, three different types of surveying. We actually interviewed local manure brokers in the fall of 2019. And then we deployed two surveys in summer of 2020, one that went to poultry growers in Delaware and another that went to grain crop producers. So that's this grain crop producer survey that had uh, the largest geographic focus. You can see that in the map that's shown there on the right. And part of the reason that this uh, survey had a geographic focus that extended beyond the Delmarva is because we partnered with that NIFWIF project that Mark Ryder and Kristen were already working on, looking at information about using poultry litter ash and ash co-products. Uh, for the remainder of this discussion, I'm going to focus on that crop producer survey uh, because I think we find some really interesting tidbits from talking to those growers. The way that we did this is that we contracted with USDA NAS to deliver our survey to farmers growing grain crops in Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Overall, we had 462 responses, and you can see the response areas on the map in green. Most of our responses came from Delmarva, Eastern Maryland, and Virginia, and we had some from Pennsylvania. Um, interestingly, we had quite a few from Northwestern Pennsylvania up in Erie County. We asked the questions about poultry litter use and some of the barriers that we as researchers thought farmers might be facing regarding the use of poultry litter. Only 19% of our respondents stated that they actually currently use poultry litter. And another 38% of respondents who did not already use poultry litter expressed interest in using it, but that they don't currently use it because they have faced barriers to getting that litter or using that litter. So let's dive a little bit into some of the results that we found from our survey. It wasn't a big surprise to us that 35% of our farmers said that they just can't access poultry litter either at all or during the times of the year when they would want to apply it to their soils as fertilizer. And then another 25% of our, our surveyors or our survey respondents said they don't know if litter is even available in their area. And then we noticed this seasonality, which we've, we've kind of already known about, that most of our regional farmers want to apply their 
litter to their annual grain crops rather than in perennial systems. So we have this hot time for poultry litter application that occurs sometime in the late winter to early spring. Unlike Kentucky, we are still usually applying early in the springtime prior to corn planting. But what happens is not all of the litter is removed from poultry houses during that same time. That litter is instead is being cleaned out throughout the year. And the timing and frequency of the cleanouts is, is really highly variable. Some of our poultry growers in our poultry grower survey indicated that they may be waiting up to a decade or longer before they even complete a whole house clean now. So this is, a, this is really kind of corroborating why we hear complaints about inability to find litter, even from grain farmers who happen to live in those areas of high density poultry production. And then litter availability is decreasing the farther that grain farmer respondent is from those high density areas of production. And so there's not always a lot of poultry litter available during the times that the farmers actually wanna use it as fertilizer. Many of the crop farmers that we surveyed also expressed a lack of knowledge about how to properly store their litter with about 28% saying that they don't know how to store it. And another 31% saying that they don't know if they don't know how to store it. So in our mind, that says they, they don't know how to store it. Um, grain farmer, our grain farms in our region are often operated separately from the poultry operations. And that means that most of our grain farmers lack access to covered manure storage sheds, which leaves field staging as the main storage option for poultry litter that is received before it can be spread on the farm. And we'll talk a little bit more about poultry staging, field staging in a little bit um, and the state regulatory setbacks and timing allowances for that. About half of our farmers express concern about neighbor relationships. So odor complaints are common during poultry litter storage and application season. As uh, my colleague Sydney Riggi often says, people tend to smell with their eyes. So when they see the piles out, the phone calls start coming in. And it's, it's also important to mention that some farmers fear that poultry litter use, if they haven't used it before, it could open them up to lawsuits. And then another half of our farmer respondents express concerns related to environmental regulations. That could include setbacks, blackout dates, or restrictions on applications to soil with elevated soil test P concentrations. And really, this isn't surprising as farmers in the Chesapeake Bay states are no stranger to environmental regulations. The last barrier I want to touch on is equipment or lack thereof. 51% of our respondents indicated that they lack access to the equipment needed to apply poultry litter. And another 19% didn't know how to answer that question. We didn't ask about specific equipment, but it could include spreaders, loaders, bucket tractors, et cetera. And there could be some hesitation for growers who haven't used poultry litter before to purchase new equipment. They may be unable or unwilling to invest in that equipment to use poultry litter, especially if they have additional problems related to access or storage. Interesting note, I found out today, Queen Anne's County, uh, they have a manure spreader that they rent out and apparently it's booked up for the season. <laughs> okay, so despite all of the barriers and there are more barriers that we found, but because of time, we could we only kind of show you the top ones there. We still believe that there are a lot of opportunities to improve our litter distribution and use on the, Demar on the Delmarva Peninsula, but we are recognizing really there's no silver bullet and that if we try a one size fits all approach, it's likely to be a unrealistic or ineffective. So we've come up with some actions we believe that would be helpful to improving nutrient balance in the region. The first is to facilitate connections. So a lot of our poultry litter transactions that are currently happening happen between private parties. Uh, unlike our dairies in the Chesapeake Bay region, which often have animals and land, I mentioned earlier that the poultry and grain operations are typically decoupled. So poultry 
and grain farmers have indicated that they lack those appropriate connections needed to buy or sell litter. And there's really a clear need to facilitate these connections. We've seen recently development of some regional manure clearing houses like the litter phone app that was recently launched by the Delmarva Chicken Association or the web-based platform that was developed by a University of Delaware team of student entrepreneurs. These are designed to help connect buyers, sellers, and service providers. And they're great tools, but they're really only gonna be useful if they're widely accessible and if people are actively using them. I mentioned earlier state-run manure transport cost share programs that are already operating in Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. In a lot of cases, these programs represent a pretty fairly sizable investment in this by the states to facilitate transport, typically out of the Chesapeake Bay region. Just to give you an example, in 2020, Maryland spent uh, $1.4 million to support manure transport. But like I showed you on our graph, a lot of those transfers are still happening within a relatively small geographical region. And it's possible that if all the states came together to the, to the table together, there could be a way to better align or regionalize those transport programs to increase efficiency. Uh, the last, oh, two more. I'm gonna focus on this idea of litter storage. Again, um, improving litter storage can have a really big impact on improving access and distribution of poultry litter for farmers that wish to land apply. First of all, Maryland recently announced that they were offering cost share to build covered manure storage on grain farms that are receiving poultry litter. However, they're receiving this cost share at a rate that's lower than for poultry growers who look to build the covered storage on their farms. Manure storage cost share will help. And we also think if we had the construction of some regional holding facilities, that could also help with distribution too. But the probably the most cost effective way to improve litter storage is really to improve our use of field staging. So currently we have a, a variability in the different regulations for field staging across the region. Maryland growers have probably the easiest access in that they can field stage for an undetermined period of time as long as the litter is going to be applied in the following spring. In Delaware, our growers are given 120 days to field stage unless they're a CAFO. But the Delaware growers can possibly increase that time frame for field staging on a case by case basis through the Delaware Department of Agriculture if they schedule a farm visit that confirms proper litter storage. And proper field staging, when we talk about that, it means following all the setbacks and maintaining that six foot high conical pile. Uh, Josh had a really nice picture of a properly field staged manure pile in his presentation. Because following those guidelines, it's been shown to greatly reduce complaints related to field staging. I wanted to mention that Virginia is the only state that currently requires folks to cover a litter pile with an impermeable wind resistant cover. If it's not covered, the pile needs to be spread within 14 days. A covered pile can be kept in the field for 180 days. Delaware and Maryland actually moved away from requiring coverings more than a decade ago when University of Delaware research showed that the properly peaked piles would form a crust, as you can see in this picture here. And that crust allows the rainwater to shed from the pile without increasing nutrient losses when they compared the amount of nutrients that were lost to the, from the covered pile. It also eliminated issues like you can see with these uh, plastic covers and the tires these tires in the summertime especially end up being mosquito breeding ground. So we believe strongly that education and workshops on field staging should be prioritized within our region. Finally, I'm gonna to touch on uh, equipment access. We think that cost share for new litter users or expansion of custom applicator services or equipment sharing could help to reduce some of these equipment barriers. However, we have to recognize, too, that some of those latter options aren't without their own barriers, like potential biosecurity issues with equipment moving between poultry farms. And I think, as many of you may know, uh, 
avian in influenza is currently on the rise. And so biosecurity is definitely a very hot topic right now. So with that, I just summarized some of our key observations. Uh, we believe, oops, sorry about that. We believe that responsible litter management supports crop production and protects water quality. And we can do this within our own region, but we know that access to poultry litter is an issue and that Delmarva farmers actually face additional barriers beyond access to that use of poultry litter. So we're hoping that we can help with programs and policies that can better support litter access and responsible use transport storage of litter. With that, I thank my funding partners and I can hopefully take some questions or Leah can take some questions before we move on. Thank you, Amy. There are a couple of questions. Um, first, uh, what um, survey data were you and Leah and the project team most surprised by? I'm going to defer that one to Leah. I think she was already starting to answer it. So I was already starting to answer it. I'll cancel my typing. Um, one of the findings that surprised me the most was how many respondents didn't know how to answer a lot of our questions. Um, so questions about, you know, Amy mentioned several of them in the presentation, but additionally questions about whether using litter was compatible with current uh, management practices on the farm, which a lot of those probably, those considerations may have dealt with tillage um, compatibility. And I was just looking, going back to the, the report we wrote to, to look up what percentage that was, because I remember it was high, it was 60% um, said that they didn't know uh, about compatibility on their farm. So that was what surprised me the most. I don't know if there were other things, Amy, that jumped out at you, but, but that, that was my. I think it was a, a, a good combination of things that we had already thought were problems and and then a couple of things, I guess, too, we were looking back at the survey data because we do notice that we have some respondents that aren't really within a reasonable distance for a transport of Delmarva litter. So we're hoping to dig a little bit deeper in the survey to find out if some of those folks who didn't know how to answer some of the questions, are they the ones that are out in Erie County, Pennsylvania? And maybe, you know, they just don't deal with poultry litter on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's kind of influencing why they don't understand how to answer those questions. Okay, and just one more clarifying question. And then there's another question in the chat that we maybe can save for the question and answer panelist period, because it's a kind of more big picture question. But real quick, how long does it take for a pile of prop properly stacked uh, poultry litter to form a crust? And I unfortunately don't know the exact time maybe josh might know but uh it's not very long and i will look that up while we're in the next presentation so that i can give a more clear answer to that but that's it's not a good very enough long. answer that's a good answer amy it, it it's pretty quick it, it has a lot to do with the type of bedding material which is typically wood shavings on the delmarva oh and josh it looks like josh put in the chat box a um a, an article about that study that Greg Benford did with the poultry litter covered versus uncovered piles. Great. And um, Amy and Leah, I will post a link to your whole report on the survey in the chat as well. Okay. Um, so now I think we are ready to hear from Dr. Peter Kleinman. Um, for many of you may recognize Dr. Kleinman is an absolute legend in this region in manure management. <laughs> So Dr. Kleinman, welcome. Uh, talk to us about manure sheds. All right, well, you've completely set me up for failure now. Uh, let me get my uh, slideshow going. So I'm Pete Kleinman. Um, I actually have moved to Colorado in the last year and I'm commuting back and forth between Colorado and Pennsylvania. And I, I drove into the Pennsylvania watershed today or to the uh, Chesapeake Bay watershed today and was struck um, that uh, that was an appropriate kind of uh, a re-entry uh, for the topic that I'm going to cover, which is the manure shed. So you've heard fantastic talks from uh, colleagues who are largely in academia and extension and who are working a lot on farm. I'm the Fed 
right here, um, who is uh, doing research, the same research that my forefathers did. Um, and I have, we have new colleagues who are on board. So my co-author Sherry Spiegel is one of those new colleagues. And so what I wanna talk to you about today is uh, something that has been around forever. And those of you who are working in manure management live this day in and day out. Um, but uh, it is just uh, an elusive uh, goal. And that is the sustainable management of manure. Uh, that has to do with the fact that there's moving targets, that uh, manure is an imperfect resource, even though it's a, it's a wonderful resource. Uh, and that uh, oftentimes, um, we let the challenges uh, kind of overwhelm the opportunities. And so the intent of developing the manure shed as a concept, and the manure shed came from some Penn State colleagues who were doing work looking just in Pennsylvania, how uh, can we kind of conceive of what the land area is that could uh, sustainably use manure over the long term, balancing all these different objectives. But really the intent of the manure shed is to keep our eye on the prize and the eye on the prize is sustainable manure of the uh, of use of, of manure as a resource. Um, uh, keep all options open. So in all of the above, and uh, it's very easy, very quickly to narrow ourselves down uh, to certain paths. And then as a result, when we face challenges to kind of conclude that, um, you know, this doesn't work that um, and uh, to, to more or less throw up our hands. So really keep those options open and then to bring everybody to the table. And so I think today's webinar, uh, by looking at the list of folks who are participating, is a, a fine example of bringing everybody to the table. But that doesn't happen when we all go back. And in fact, today we, we have some, some notable absences that I might kind of cover as well. So the manure shed is something that is a concept. It applies at different scales. Um, and it's essentially the land area around an area of manure generation of animal production um, that can sustainably absorb uh, manure as a resource. Kind of a slippery um, uh, definition, but it's something that can be applied everywhere and is really looking at manure as a resource again. So uh, we've taken this really as a, a concept that uh, we're trying to apply nationally right now through uh, USDA's LTAR, it's the Long-Term Agroecological Research Network and with a real eye towards sustainability. And so sustainability, again, um, like uh, manure management is a topic that's been around for a long time and is one um, that uh, has uh, had people throw up their hands around. But everyone understands that what we're seeking to do right here is to balance a number of priorities. Uh, they include productivity and profitability priorities. There's environmental priorities. And then there are these other priorities that have to do with the, the, those of the local communities. And so that's what this larger research network is trying to establish. And I'd argue that that's what everybody on this call today is basically involved in. And so from that network, you look at things a little differently and you realize that, you know, really we're in the business of trying to reintegrate systems um, that have been purposefully and for good reason separated over time. So can we reintegrate crop and livestock production to address this kind of diversity of concerns that we have. And on the left here, you see this kind of standard diagram of the crops that are grown. Uh, and uh, it's kind of a heat map uh, for different types of crops. And you see the uh, grain belts kind of jumping out. You can see uh, areas of corn production in the Midwest, wheat production as well. Then you look at the manure distribution. And of course, the Delmarva pops up. And I'm sure the folks on Delmarva are tired of seeing it pop up but it's a very, very real type of a concentration of an industry as Amy pointed out. Um, and as a result, uh, there's an accumulation of manure nutrients because the animals that we're producing are inefficient, even as we've had great, great gains in processing the resources that we give them, the, the feed uh, nutrients that we provide them. So a lot of us work on all types of manure management issues that, um, don't, really don't seem like they should be uh, immediately a concern. So where I've moved to now, it's, you know, ammonia deposition in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, in uh, the Chesapeake area, you're, you're looking at, uh, you know, water quality issues around the bay. Um, and then if you look at things from a resource perspective, it might be, um, why are we reversing the Haber-Bosch process with the way we handle our manures if nitrogen is so valuable, especially as it is today, um, and the same with phosphorus. Why um, are we mining phosphorus in different areas and then concentrating it 
when over the long term we know the best thing really should be to distribute that. So those are kind of ideals, you know, they're uh, things that uh, we want to go after in order to mitigate some environmental concern, but they're unbelievably difficult to, to, to grapple with, as you, you know. So enter the menor shed. The menor shed, we all, I mean, if we leave today, it's that everybody lives in a menor shed, even if you don't have livestock produced locally, there's a possibility to use mineral resources in your area to address sustainable production issues. So this can make you very, very idealistic. And when you do that, you become naive. Um, and if you're naive, you set yourself up for failure. But we do recognize that manure has all kinds of components to it that can be used uh, as resources. Um, they can deliver nutrients to crops. They can build uh, healthy soils. Um, they can be used uh, to produce energy that provides value uh, to various folks. Could be a farm, could be uh, a community. Um, and they can be used in, in other end uses as well. So the manure shed that is intended really to start to distribute those manure resources so that they achieve that resource kind of a goal. And you heard this from Amy in particular just now, and that is that everybody who walks into manure thinking that they've, they've struck brown gold um, is confronted with the reality that, um, you know, it's manure. <laughs> And so you deal with everything from nuisance odors to the fact that as a fertilizer resource, it's not a perfect resource. Um, we have a stoichiometry in the manure, a, a balance of, of nutrients that isn't necessarily one that uh, we would pursue if we were to go out and use a commercial fertilizer. And then manures, if we don't watch out, can also be vectors for other things. And, and Amy mentioned uh, bio uh, concerns, biohazard concerns, uh, but there's certainly other concerns as well. So we have to keep that in mind as we try to bring everybody to the table and use manure sustainably, is that this is uh, you know, a resource that has a downside as well as an upside. Manure sheds then uh, are things that could happen at all kinds of scale. And so classically, nutrient management uh, and um, our extension programs have focused on manure at a farm scale, really that distribution, that sustainable use, the four Rs, of sustainable nutrient uh, uh, use um, that's applied at a farm scale that the upper images of a farm in, in New York, where you can see some hot spots for soil phosphorus that have to do just with the location of barns and the fact that particular farmer was just over the long term uh, applying manure to fields that were near barns when other fields could very much use it. So Amy showed that at another scale when she was uh, demonstrating how in the Delmarva region there plenty of opportunities to improve soils with uh, manure additions, um, and that's at a, at a regional scale. Manure sheds occur not just, you know, at the farm, as uh, just mentioned, but also at, at kind of community scales. And so that central image there is uh, actually uh, from uh, Sherry Spiegel in New Mexico, where um, dairies uh, have a finite land area um, to distribute their manure. And increasingly in some places, because of their concentration along river valleys, and oftentimes their urban areas, are in competition with land that's turning over and becoming urbanized. And so um, looking at manure sheds as something that moves beyond the farm is, of course, is something that you who are in the audience today do all the time, but it's very important. And now you're transcending, you're bringing in other actors, and I'll start to talk about who those actors are in a minute. And then finally, you have regional and national scale. I think it's extremely important that we look beyond state lines and that um, we look further than that in terms of uh, the individuals and entities that we bring on board, because oftentimes uh, the solutions require some distance of travel. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna get into this. We've had uh, some wonderful analysis from social scientists as to who is involved regularly who should be involved and who could be involved. Um, and so there's a long kind of list of agents um, who uh, could be involved. And as I mentioned, many of them are on this particular call right here. Um, some of them are key at different scales. And so I'm gonna get into that right now. So this is what uh, Gwinder Meredith uh, led, which was basically looking at different scales in which you're trying to sustainably distribute manure uh, either on the farm, uh, in the neighborhood, um, across the county, or over to a neighboring state, or really at, at a broader level. And what you see here as part of this network analysis 
is who uh, you know really must be involved. Um, and uh, there's a uh, at the kind of finer scales. You're dealing, of course, with the producers, um, and the producers are um, uh, you know always you know in the mix. That's frequently who we target all these presentations to. Um, but they're not the only player there. We certainly we have to bring in advisors. Um, and uh, then there's roles for extension kind of regularly. As we move up, we start to bring other folks in who need to be involved in the conversation in order to make sure that we move manure along. So this is the must. Um, and I'm gonna try to, let's see. Um, and here is a full network diagram for a farm scale showing who should be involved. Those are the dark lines uh, that they're now in addition to the producers, the advisors, and extension. You have others who should be involved in that, the fertilizer distributors, uh, manure haulers. Um, there's a role for, um, for research um, at that local level as well. So that's the science there too. And so, uh, and then who could be involved is basically everybody who's in this constellation of, of actors who you see right, right there. Okay. So there, you can look at uh, manure sheds also through the lens of, uh, of kind of groups. And uh, so Rob uh, Minen and Ray Bryant uh, led a few analyses for poultry and uh, swine industries. These are vertically integrated industries in which there's a lot of coordination and there's a lot of opportunity for manure shed management. In fact, we've had some wonderful conversations um, with uh, some of the integrators. Um, uh, to, just to get a perspective on how they achieve manure shed management. Uh, all of them strive for that sustainable manure shed management. Uh, all of them are challenged, uh, again, because of the nature of manure and the way we have our production systems distributed. What you can see here though, and as you'll see the Delmarva, is that as we look at kind of poultry and swine as these integrated industries, and we start to look at their associated manure sheds at a county level, we have this mega manure shed that kind of extends up. I've got Sherry uh, Heron's uh, beloved, you know, Arkansas and um, uh, area that the Ozarks uh, on the left there. Um, but you see up through Appalachia as part of really the uh, agricultural development of the poultry industry and of the swine industry, these areas of concentration of animal production that in turn result in manure sheds that kind of spill out across the region. And so there's an interaction then that happens um, that's very important. But also, as you look away from the Delmarva, you see that Delmarva is not unique in terms of its concentration and uh, the issues that it has to face uh, with regard to manure. These are kind of famously played up in these legacy issues. So the legacy issues, if you're in the Chesapeake Bay, are a profound headache. Um, and that has to do with yesteryear's management um, and the fact that we're spending a lot of time on nutrient management today to try to improve water quality when in fact uh, it's some of the behavior that we've had in the past, some of our decisions uh, in the past that are contributing to that. And that's really manifest in this concept of legacy phosphorus that lingers around today, um, even as we bring in best management practices and can undermine conservation programs. So the mega manure shed then is really pops up in terms of a legacy phosphorus analysis as you see in the lower right hand corner. I mentioned the interaction. So Rob Minen looked at uh, this interaction between poultry and uh, swine in Pennsylvania. And so that's your you know, neighboring state to the Northwest. Um, and um, if you look over time, what you see is a movement of hogs out of the Southeast really, more uh, toward uh, the West and, and, and the North. Um, and then really a movement into the state of, of, of poultry. And so uh, for those of you on the Delmarva, this is you know, kind of uh, symbolized by like Bill and Evans' uh, you know, great growth um, uh, in the region, but it's, it's not only limited to that. And so you have an interaction now between industries that actually then adds to the complexity that we're all aware of uh, in terms of manure management options, where you have very different types of manures, you have different industries, you have different types of uh, feed uh, um, areas. And so you've got to look uh, beyond that. But the point here being that, uh, again, kind of keep your eye on the prize, these things change, but it doesn't mean that we can't uh, continue to focus 
on the needs of those industries and the challenges that they face as they get into the inertia types of issues. So as we move up in scale, we start to move to these collective issues. And these are the types of things that have already been referenced here. So that Purdue agro recycle plant um, that um, actually moved a lot of pelletized litter around the country, even if it wasn't um, a sustainable one in terms of the economics. Does that mean that pelletizing is uneconomical? No, um, it does not at all. Uh, in fact, uh, I think that uh, there's successful um, examples of it. And also you can look at this just from an engineering perspective and decisions that were made kind of uh, at square one aren't ones that we would make today in terms of uh, how we, we go about pelletizing. There's other examples as well. My point here being that some of these succeeded for a while. Some of them were completely dependent on government subsidy. And when the subsidy went away, they were unable to continue on. Um, but there, that doesn't mean that they were absolute failures just because they're not around today. There was a lot that worked um, in them. And for us to be able to sustainably use manures, we have to pull out what worked and figure out how we make that part of today's solution. So these are all community types of activities. Sherry Heron, I noticed, she announced herself as on the call. She's part of a very, very famous case study uh, that involved uh, the, um, some uh, watersheds in uh, Arkansas and um, Oklahoma. And uh, there was a tremendous amount of innovation that went through as a result of a litigated uh, outcome. But what I wanted to point here was uh, their innovation to uh, bailing poultry litter so that they could provide storage and make it available to grain farmers. And so uh, you heard that from Amy earlier, that that was one in, in the Del Marva seen as one uh, of the key areas. If we're going to see a poultry used as a substitution for fertilizer or used on uh, grain uh, operations. And uh, there's certainly examples of ways in which without building large storages, uh, we can um, you know, find ways of making it available at the time that it's needed. Um, the, in uh, Dane County, Wisconsin, there's a um, community manure digester that continues to work to this day. I put together this, this slide or a version of the slide about 15 years ago. Um, all of these were examples. The, the Minwat one, unfortunately, is no longer with us. Um, but uh, that that Dane County one is continuing to operate well uh, and is actually the source of tremendous innovation. And so I've got in the, just in the lower right-hand corner of that uh, Wisconsin uh, photo, uh, a picture of uh, a company Aqua that's working with them in terms of treating the manures so that they can actually discharge uh, effluent back to, uh, to streams. Um, and this is what happens when you kind of keep your eye on the prize um, and uh, continue to invest uh, in some of these larger uh, types of uh, um, uh, manure um, uh, solutions. So um, the last few things I want to kind of feature, uh, you've heard of already, that, that need for connectivity. Um, I think the Litter app is a great, great example of that. They're not the end all, right? They just kind of help in the process of making connections, but we need to make sure then that as it, things move across state lines, um, as we look for ways of uh, improving hauling, as markets get tighter um, or markets then, you know, today we have fertilized prices that very much favor the movement of manure if we want to do it, that we're able to absorb that. Um, and so the point here being is that we have these innovations that are out there that absolutely need to be applied, but they can't be seen in isolation as the solution. They're just part of the system that needs to be tapped into in order for us um, to uh, solve uh, the manure resource kind of issues. And Josh um, McGrath, who is our kind of uh, resident um, Renaissance man, has worked with economists um, and has a wonderful paper that's out there, if you look at Journal of Environmental Quality, that he alluded to before, that looks at the role of auctions and auction houses in helping to provide some of the market forces that we need to provide value. And so this is where it's not just farmers, it's not just extension who need to be involved, right? You need to have other players. So I've mentioned, you know, bringing industry, we've talked about fertilizer uh, um, uh, industry, we've talked about um, other partners as well, maybe big, big government, um, 
but we really need to bring um, uh, the kind of the whole complement of actors who are out there to bear so that we can come up with these sustainable solutions because otherwise they end up as one-offs. And that's the intent of the manure shed. The manure shed is kind of keep our eye on the prize that we want to move manure to all these places, not just to one. And we want to use multiple approaches, not just one. So I'm going to just leave you with this kind of impression that we, you know, we all live in a manure shed. I'm the Fed. I'm not like, you know, I'm a federal researcher, so I'm not extension. So my talk wasn't as practical per se, but it should remind you that as you're banging your head against the wall, looking at manure solutions, uh, you're not alone. Um, and in fact, uh, you want to reach out and make sure you bring others on board so that we um, address it uh, as a community. All right. That's my talk.